installment of the CXO, of the CXO Wellness Grand Rounds. We are pleased to host the National Geographic Geopolitical Conflict Photographer, David Gutenfelder. David has covered the genocide in Rwanda, the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, the nuclear disaster in Japan, and the elusive lives of North Korea. He is a seven-time finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Additionally, David has been an industry leader in smartphone photography and was named the inaugural Instagram Photographer of the Year by Time Magazine. More recently, David has been photographing wildlife in Yellowstone National Park. Documenting the atrocities of war and suppression comes at a personal cost. How does one reconcile one's privilege and mortality while simultaneously documenting other suffering? And is there personal redemption, perhaps, in a return to nature? So David will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. Feel free to write the questions in the chat as you think of them, or you can send them to me personally if you'd like within the chat. So without further delay, please welcome David Gutenfelder. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all for coming and uh, uh, welcoming me today. Um, and even more importantly, I'd like to just say a big heartfelt, heartfelt thank you for all that you do for all of us. Uh, I hope that you're told that every day, um, especially since 2020 and all that you and the rest of the world has been through. I'm gonna share my screen and get started here. Okay. I can't say that I know very much about uh, what your jobs and lives have been like uh, over the last couple of years. Um, but I know that when I imagine that or when I hear uh, all of us talk about healthcare professionals, we often use words like essential, uh, frontline, sacrifice, exhaustion, duty, and purpose. Um, and I would say that I want to talk today about some of the parallels of my own profession and my own life. Um, and so those are the kinds of words that uh, I think it's fair to say are used when, talk, when we talk about um, photojournalists, at least the kinds of photojournalists that um, go to the front lines of you know, global conflict. These are images of mine from the Israel-Lebanon war and the civil war in Liberia. Or photographers who take their cameras to natural disasters like the tsunami in 2004 in Banda Aceh, Indonesia, or the aftermath of um, the earthquake in Kashmir and Pakistan, humanitarian crises where we go and witness things that uh, are very difficult to um, process and explain to the world. Um, or photographers who take their cameras out into the streets um, to photograph civil unrest, uh, social justice and protest. Now, these are pictures of mine uh, taken over the last uh, two years, uh, just a few blocks from my home right here in my neighborhood where I live in Minneapolis after the, uh, the killing of George Floyd. And of course, uh, photographers, uh, healthcare professionals, and all of us um, face, when we face uh, this pandemic, when it hits our hometowns, all of our communities, it's happened to all of us all over the world. Um, this is the main street shut down in 2020 um, in the small town where I grew up in Iowa. So my career has looked like this. Uh, I've been a news photographer covering wars, conflict, humanitarian crises, both natural and man-made um, in nearly 100 countries around the world. Um, and as a documentary photographer, I've covered geopolitical and conservation issues. Uh, and I'm currently working on my 25th story for National Geographic, which I started this week. 
So I'm gonna spend this time, I guess, just telling my own story, walking you through my own path, um, because I, I think it's an opportunity for uh, you all to see some of the parallels between um, uh, our lives and the work that we do. And we'll hopefully spark some conversation and some questions at the end. Um, I'm always asked sort of the same questions over and over again. And I, when I thought about that uh, in preparing for this conversation, I thought, you know, those are the questions that I would want to ask uh, people in healthcare right now. Questions like, how does, you know, you know, facing danger every day, witnessing traumatic uh, experiences, uh, how do you process that? How do you deal with that? How do you sustain a life like that? when two weeks becomes two years, becomes your career, becomes your whole life's path. Um, other questions that I'm asked that I would ask you all uh, about burnout and com so-called compassion fatigue. Um, you know, how do you can continue to make these kind of sacrifices in your life and you know, rise, stand up and answer this calling uh, when, you know, maybe the people who you're trying to help um, sometimes reject you or, uh, you know, in, maybe in your case, uh, it's a rejection of science. And in my case, uh, I'm called fake news. Um, other questions, how do you sort of maintain a sort of separation or a detachment or uh, uh, when you're standing in front of someone or when someone's life is in your hands, how, how do you, you know, do your job and um, in, the, in that moment um, be empathetic, but also, um, you know, uh, detached enough to be able to continue to work. Um, also, you know, when you're called to duty, how do you find balance between that purpose and that responsibility with the responsibilities uh, in your normal life and to your families and to your loved ones. Um, and last, I guess, how do you process this? Where do you go when you need help? How do you, um, you know, find solace or uh, how do you restore yourself? Um, so those are the things that I'm gonna sort of uh, frame this conversation around, but to do that, I'm going to talk about my path and my career. So I'm going to back up a little bit, way back. Uh, this is me, age three. I grew up in rural Iowa. This is a photograph of me on my grandparents' farm. Uh, obviously, uh, this it does not look like the kind of guy that was going to have much purpose or uh, be a National Geographic photographer and see the world. Growing up in a place like uh, rural Iowa, um, it's very hard to see sort of over the horizon. I didn't, I didn't know anyone who was a doctor. I didn't know anyone who'd ever been to university. Um, I didn't, I'd never seen the ocean when I was 17 years, up until I was 17 years old. I didn't know anyone who owned a passport. And I was the first Gutenfelder to go to university and certainly the first Gutenfelder to travel uh, to Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, where when I was uh, 19 years old, I left the University of Iowa and I did an 18 month foreign exchange program. And this is me uh, living with my host family. It was during that year that I learned for the first time how to step outside of my own culture, my own experience, um, and to learn another language and to make connections with people uh, very different from myself. It was also when I first started taking pictures and I wasn't taking pictures at the time because I thought I was going to be a National Geographic photographer someday, but I just wanted to do what we all do with our cameras, which is um, you know, capture memories, be creative and bring back those photographs so that you can make connections between the people that I came to love um, in my home in Tanzania and the people that I love back home. But I used those images and I got my first job at a newspaper Circulation 9,000 uh, in uh, Iowa City, Iowa, the Daily Iowa. And this is the kind of photography that I was doing at the time, a, a far cry from a National Geographic uh, job. Munching Doritos, this is a picture of a squirrel eating a nacho on a picnic table. 
so I share this picture not only to make fun of my uh, origins as a photographer, but also because I took this picture in 1994 and there was something else happening in the world in 1994. And I had this voice in my head constantly that I love my job. I was taking pictures for a community newspaper. Um, it was really a dream. Um, but I had this voice in my head saying that, you know, there must be something else that I can do more. Um, so in 1994, I watched as this happened. Hundreds of thousands of refugees streaming over the border from Rwanda into neighboring Tanzania, where I had been a student and into then Zaire, now Congo. I knew people there. I spoke the language. I was very concerned on a like a direct uh, level because I was worried about the people who I loved in Eastern Africa. Um, and I decided sitting in my apartment in Iowa City that I would quit my job at this little newspaper and I would go back to East Africa, um, not, not only to find out what's happening to my friends um, in their communities, but also to try and do something more as a photographer. So I had a total of uh, $2,800 in my bank account and I put every single thing I owned into one backpack and I went to Nairobi Kenya and began literally hitchhiking until I made it to Rwanda. I thought that I would spend a few weeks or months in the country contributing something to the understanding of what was happening, the genocide in Rwanda. Um, but that turned into uh, really the next decade. I, there was so much uh, going on across the continent. It was a very dark time. And I ended up uh, finding myself working in Somalia, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Congo, all across the country, largely covering um, conflict and, uh, and war. And I spent my entire 20s doing this, living out of a backpack and covering uh, things that would be very difficult for me to describe to, to you or to anyone who wasn't there. Um, it was a very hard path, quite honestly. I was separated from my loved ones for months and years at a time. I witnessed really unspeakable things. I saw my photographs fall short of making a difference often. Um, I lost friends in front of my eyes. I was wounded, injured myself. Um, and at the end of that decade of my 20s, I wasn't really sure that I wanted to keep doing this. Um, you know, I survived an attack in Sierra Leone where one of my closest friends was killed next to me and um, another colleague was gravely, very badly injured and I had to literally physically carry both of them out of the country on my shoulders. And a few months later, my closest friend, the best man in my wedding, also a photojournalist, went back to Sierra Leone and was killed in very, very similar circumstances. And I just, it pulled the rug out from underneath this purpose that I had developed. And I wasn't sure that I was prepared to keep going. That question was kind of answered for me because uh, a few months later, September 11 happened and I was called by my employers to go and respond. I, within days after the 9-11 uh, attacks, I went to Paki neighboring Pakistan and crossed the border into Afghanistan to a place called Tora Bora, which we now know was where Osama bin Laden was taking refuge and then slipped over the border back into Pakistan. I covered the war in Iraq. I spent three years inside Iraq uh, before, during, and after the US-led invasion. I spent a decade inside Afghanistan photographing um, the US-led war, US troops. Um, you know, I said that I spent my 20s and a decade of my life uh, in Africa. I spent my, all of my 30s 
really covering the aftermath of September 11 and the war on terror across the Middle East. Um, this is what it looks like to go and photograph something like that. You really put yourself out into the center of, of it all. And then you photograph the people who are right next to you. It's all you can do as a photographer. It's not a, it's not a looking at down from 30,000 feet. Uh, it's really um, the connections that you make with the people right next to you and the stories that you tell about them. And not just, you know, American military, obviously, but the impact of decades of war on uh, the country and the people of a place like Afghanistan. So that's where I guess I'd say I made my stand. I decided to stick it out. I decided that uh, you know this purpose and this calling was uh, still important and important to me. This is also in Afghanistan where National Geographic found me. Um, you can't really apply for a job for National Geographic. Unfortunately, they sort of look all over the world for photographers who have um, become an authority on a place um, or a topic uh, and they reach out to you. And this was my case in Afghanistan. I got an email one day on my satellite phone in, Afghan in, in, in Kabul and the, it was from National Geographic Director of Photography and the, the subject line said possible Nat Geo assignment. And I, I couldn't even open it. I like peeked through my fingers. I was so worried that it may or may not be true. And it was true. And that was my first assignment. It was an assignment where I spent um, several months um, photographing uh, the impact of opium production on the war insurgency and on the culture and society of Afghanistan and agricultural alternatives. Um, like I said, I've done 25 stories for Nat Geo since. Um, there are a wide range of, of stories. Uh, this, these pictures come from uh, an amazing adventure and experience I had photographing uh, from the source of the Mekong River in Southeast Asia to the Delta in Vietnam uh, for a story about uh, hydropower damming of the, one of the world's last, uh, wild, last and wildest uh, rivers. When, when living in Japan um, in 2011, uh, the country had a triple disaster, uh, a once in a millennia level tsunami, which, or sorry, a, a mass, you know, massive earthquake, once in a generation earthquake, and then a massive tsunami that inundated the entire coastline, um, killing hundreds of thousands and, and displacing people. And then of course, the, uh, the Daiichi nuclear uh, power plant was inundated and exploded, sending nucle nuclear reactive material all over the region. And I went inside for National Geographic where I spent uh, 21 weeks living uh, inside the nuclear exclusion zone in schools and in my car, uh, showing what happened to the people of um, this region in Japan, um, which was now a poison radioactive zone. My family lived in uh, with me my wife and two daughters in Japan. And um, I had to, you know, say goodbye to them in our little apartment and head north while they were left behind. And I think this is something that um, you all might be able to relate to, um, stepping out the door every day, going um, to do your job in a dangerous place and, you know, while your family is home doing Zoom school. I worked in Cuba uh, covering the ongoing changes, Cuban society and the relationship between the US and Cuba. Um, but also uh, I went back for the funeral of Fidel Castro driving all the way across the country and back um, following his funeral cortege and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people lined the roads all the way to and back. This is an image from North Korea. Uh, I've had the very unusual uh, opportunity and experience of being the only Western photographer to ever have regular access inside the uh, very infamously isolated country. I've made nearly 50 trips inside North Korea where I've covered daily life of people, uh, the propaganda, the cities, 
and over time, traveling to every province of the country, um, to places that, um, you know, no Westerner or certainly no Western photographer had ever, had ever seen. Um, and it was a chance for me to, despite the estrangement of uh, North Korea and its neighbors and the um, saber rattling between the US and the United States, a chance for me to go and be a photographer and be a humanist and to look into the eyes of North Korean people and have them look back at me and make photographs that I hope um, deliver this message, which is that there are people uh, there and all over the world worthy of our understanding. National Geographic made me a conservation photographer and I found that I could uh, be a conflict photographer for, uh, for species other than our own. This is an image from a story I did with the writer Jonathan Franzen um, about the protection of songbirds. Uh, there are something like 6 billion migratory birds that travel across the Mediterranean and back every year and there nearly a billion of them are killed for food and sport. And uh, we traveled multiple countries and the impact of this story was a moratorium on hunting all across the Mediterranean in several countries. National Geographic gave me the absolute amazing opportunity to photograph and meet and spend time with some of the heroes uh, of my life, including Jane Goodall, who I got to go to Tanzania sort of full circle back to Dar es Salaam where I was as a student and spend um, days with her photographing portraits of her uh, in her home and at work. And 25 years really to the day after I packed my, uh, <laughs> packed my bag and went off to Rwanda, I returned back to the United States. Um, National Geographic, uh, named me in that year a National Geographic Explorer. Um, I'm a National Geographic Explorer not because I climb the highest mountains in the world or I scuba dive or um, I do any of the things that uh, the other National Geographic Explorers do. Um, I can't do any of those things, but they may be an explorer because they said that I was willing to, I was the one willing to go to places where others weren't. weren't and I was willing to step outside of my own culture and experience and um, use photography to make connections uh, between people. And then that was really the proudest moment of my, of my career. And since then returning to the United States, I've been photographing my own country for the first time. I'd never photographed in America. Um, and I really turned my eye towards the thing first that I, I guess I cherished most and that was um, our public land conservation efforts, um, our national parks. I spent 18 months inside Yellowstone National Park with biologists and wildlife living in a ranger's cabin. Um, and I've been continuing to work in our national parks across uh, the country. This is the Apostle Islands in, uh, in Wisconsin, just up the road from here. Um, I kayaked all 21 uh, islands in Lake Superior of the Apostle Islands. Um, a month long camping trip, paddling trip. Um, and I'm doing this not only to create stories for National Geographic about national parks and public land, but it's really part of a bigger project um, about the restorative power of wilderness and wild and work um, and how someone like me who really only began processing what I've been through over those 25 years uh, abroad, um, processing it for the first time when I came home and going into the wild and going into wilderness um, as a way for me to, um, to sort of uh, recover and, and reconnect. Um, and I'm doing a project like that all across the country in national parks um, programs for wounded warriors, uh, people with physical, uh, uh, physical injuries, moral injuries, PTSD. These are guys, former military, who now um, hike through uh, the Everglades National Park, um, trapping uh, invasive pythons, which are now taking over as the alpha predator in the National Park. And these, these guys have, um, have found that they 
uh, can sort of return a piece of their purpose that they had when they were serving in the military and be be useful and to get out into the into the wilderness and wild um, in doing this project. So my aim over the last few years had been to really immerse myself in uh, the US national parks. In fact, I had planned to go to all of them, especially with my two daughters. Um, and then 2020 happened. Um, first, or not first, COVID was first, but um, for, we, for, for us here in, in Minneapolis, uh, the most sort of impactful event of 2020, I think, was um, the, the murder of George Floyd in the immediate aftermath. This is George, a place now called, that we call George Floyd Square. It's the intersection of 38th and Chicago in South Minneapolis, not too far from my house, uh, where George Floyd was killed. Um, and it's become a sort of living memorial. Um, this all happened. Uh, I was ashamed of my city when I saw the video that we've all seen. Um, but it was also a path uh, for me back into my own community to reevaluate my roles and responsibilities here as a as a citizen of Minneapolis, um, as a dad. Um, and as a member of this community. Um, this is a young guy named Dattel Straub holding up his diploma during the immediate sort of uh, protests after George Floyd was killed um, when much of South Minneapolis was on fire. Uh, I saw these young guys jump out of a car all wearing their bright red graduation caps and gowns from Patrick Henry High School and the police aimed uh, a weapon at them and I saw the red dot of the scope of the rifle go across all three of these young men's bodies and Dattel responded by holding up his diploma and we all ran away and I had a chance to get his contacts and I called him that night and I asked him what he would what they were doing what that was all about and he said because of COVID we couldn't walk on the stage so we decided to put on our robes and to show that there's black excellence in our community. And we walked the streets as our stage and we protested. And I, this moment of all that I saw in Minneapolis over the last two years was the one that really, uh, really truly impacted me. Uh, this print is hanging in Patrick Henry High School. It's a source of pride for their school. And it was, um, it was a way for me to uh, to be reminded of um, why I'm doing this job from the beginning, and that and how I've been able to keep uh, keep going. And that is, I get my resilience when I meet people who show their resilience. Someone like Dattel. And the last I want to talk about is the coronavirus. Um, in March of 2020, when, you know, really, we all first started to understand what, <laughs> the enormity of this, um, I didn't know what to do. I had all kinds of uh, professional work lined up. I had, was planning to go to India the first week of March, um, I was going to China, Taiwan, I was going to Korea, I had all these things planned and everything evaporated. And I lost my, um, I lost my work. Um, but more importantly, I felt that I lost my purpose. I didn't really know how to respond. I didn't know in that moment, what was the right thing to do? What was the safe? What was the responsible thing to do? And I walked, you know, we were being told to stay in our homes, um, flatten the curve. Um, I had ventured out of my house in a mask and I walked down to the lake a block from my home in Minneapolis. And I saw these two young girls parking their car to have a 
what we now know of a you know a social distanced you know hangout. And I saw all these people parked six feet apart all along the lake shore, and they were watching the sunset in the way that we would maybe watch a drive-in movie, just this cinematic beauty as the sun went down. And I immediately understood right then that um, there was a silver lining to this. And that what I know from all of the years of traveling to complicated uh, places and watching the struggle is that you, what you remember is what you did. What you remember is um, how you stood up and what you did in that moment. And so at that point, I decided that I was going to declare myself essential. <laughs> I packed my cameras, I packed everything, my clothes and sleeping bag and uh, all the PPE that I could get my hands on and I put it all in the back of my truck and I hit the road and I went out and decided that I would try to tell the story of the coronavirus in my own community and in my own backyard. Um, I was telling National Geographic, come on, send me to the, you know, send me to the frontline hospitals in New York, send me to Italy. And they were like, take it easy. Like what everyone needs to do is um, figure out what their responsibilities are in their own communities. And that's what you need to do as a photographer. And I took that to heart. I photographed, um, again, 4th of July, when the rest of the world is, um, you know, would typically be by the lake, you know, grilling. This is what healthcare people were working in military. And this is uh, a worker in a meatpacking plant where there was some of the greatest outbreaks uh, in the country, all here in the Midwest. Um, and I photographed him uh, through a window because at that time I had no idea what was safe and responsible. Someone with the coronavirus. This is actually uh, in March of 2020, the first person that I ever saw that I met who had the coronavirus. I photographed the sort of political fallout and the divide that we've seen all across our country. Um, this was a anti-mask, uh, anti, um, anti-shutdown rally on the Capitol, state Capitol steps in Madison, Wisconsin. It changed the way that I work. This is a, a, a woman and her son dressed as the Easter Bunny on Easter in a small town in Iowa, uh, going around door to door, offering social distanced uh, Easter eggs, try to, bring, to try to bring some joy to people stuck in their homes. Um, I started, I made this photograph with a drone. Uh, changed the way I work. I started going into communities um, and I would say, hey, do you mind if I take your picture with my safe social distance flying camera? And being Midwesterners, they always would say, do what you gotta do. And I've made pictures like this, with the woman on the left, uh, a frontline nurse and her sister-in-law. And they, every day they would, they would meet one another and um, sit in their backyard the safe distance and sort of process what they were going through in the hospital and in their homes. Um, you know, and I started leaving my business card, you know, on the sidewalk after I would photograph them with my drone and, and say, you know, send me an email, tell me your story. Um, and I was amazed that people would send me these long heartfelt, you know, emails and essays. Um, and I found that like, something that I've known about photography for a long time that typically people like to be, to be seen and to share and to and, um, have their voice uh, heard. And that's what I experienced during the coronavirus is that I received dozens and dozens of emails from people and correspondence with people, some whom I'm still in contact with um, about what they and we are all going through. This is Dave. It was his 50th birthday. Um, his wife threw this party for him. He came out on the sidewalk in his Crocs and silly hat. And uh, I watched as people just drove up and down the street honking and waving to Dave. Um, 
And again, I, I share this photo just because um, I feel like it's one of the great examples of uh, resiliency and where I get my own strength as a photographer. So I think with that, um, I'd like to leave it there and maybe open it up for some discussion and some questions. Um, I hope that you found some, uh, some questions and some parallels uh, in the work that I'm doing and the work that you're doing. Thank you, David, very much for that. I appreciate it. And thanks to those who have sent some questions in. Um, so this one may be uh, kind of applicable to what we do. Um, have you ever had to choose between doing the right, in quote, the right thing and getting the right photo? Yeah, yes, that's a very, very good question. Um, I'm sure that is something that uh, I imagine medical professionals ask themselves often, like, how do you, as I said earlier, how do you balance this? Um, uh, it's happened to me too many times to count, honestly, um, where I'm in a situation where someone is in need of immediate help, uh, when I'm there to offer a different kind of help, sort of bigger picture. Um, and I guess every experience is, is different. And um, there are times when I coldly do my job and photograph what's in front of me. And there are times when I leave my camera in the car and get out and act. Um, I think if there's a if there's a rule that's sort of settled in my head over all these years, it's that um, if I'm in a situation where there are people there that can help, people better equipped than I, medics, military, uh, and there are those who they can offer, offer help, then I let them do their job and I go and go ahead and do mine. But in the cases where I've been literally the only person that could help, then, um, you know, a photograph is not going to help that person. And uh, I'll put my camera down and do whatever I have to do. Thank you. Um, maybe um, going off that a little bit, um, when in the field, are, are you taking photographs every day or all the time? That is, are you always on? Hmm. When I was a news photographer, I would say I was always on. Um, you know, it was really more like a first aid kind of, or military kind of job where I would get a call in the night. We need you to go to Lebanon on the first flight. Um, and when I was there, I was photographing all the time, not just every day, but you know, really just, you know, all the time. Um, working with National Geographic and the, the kinds of stories I'm doing, that I'm typically doing now is, is different. Um, it's a different pace. I'm digging a little bit deeper. It requires a lot, of, a lot more, um, you know, planning and production and research. And I can get, actually get frustrated as a former news photographer with how much time it takes to ramp up to get going on a job. Um, and when I'm in the field, uh, I photograph less and less. You know, I find that, you know, listening and being a part of a community uh, first is the most important thing I can do before I ever take out my camera. And, um, and so, you know, in the end, I feel like photography is sort of just the, the kind of like tip of the iceberg and everything else I'm doing in terms of travel and logistics and preparation and research and planning and 
relationship building is uh, how I spend most of my time these days. And uh, I, I think this question related probably more toward your kind of early part in your career, uh, but do, do people, I suppose, did people harass you when you were working? Um, do they, did they see you as a threat? I suppose that could be different between what you were doing in Rwanda or East Africa versus, uh, you know, in the streets of Minneapolis. Yeah, that is a really interesting and complicated question because course, every situation and place is different. Um, if I can answer it, I guess uh, an easy answer I would say is that I think it's getting harder. I think, I think that in the past, in most places where I've worked, a photographer like me was treated by everyone as a sort of neutral, as a neutral observer. And that change has changed a lot over the years where the assumption is now that I am, um, you know, that I represent one side or another. And I think that that's played out in the United States a lot. I've, you know, I've only lived here a few years again and I've only worked in the United States, uh, you know, basically since the start of the Trump administration until now. And, you know, I feel like, I feel like when I share an image, let's say on my social media, I am mostly criticized and it comes from both sides. Uh, I'm criticized, uh, you know, in our divided country, I'm criticized uh, saying that, you know, that I'm, you know, that I have some agenda or I'm taking sides. Um, and it, the criticism comes from both sides on the same image. <laughs> and, in the, and in the field, when I'm out there, um, I occasionally, you know, we can just talk about the United States, if I'm talking about covering like politics, you know, a, you know, modern div divisive politics, um, or, you know, protest. Um, I, I, did, I did face some like really strong kind of visceral reactions from, from all sides. Um, but by and large, I think that, um, I think that people uh, really just let me do my work and still kind of have a foundational understanding of what a photographer and a journalist is supposed to be doing. Thank you. Um, there's a question. Uh, what is the mood among photojournalists in terms of continuing, continuing their profession? Um, and he says, P.S. I love National Geographic. <laughs> I, yeah, thank you. Um, for that, I love National Geographic too. Uh, I don't think it's, I think our industry is, is not in a really particularly great place right now. Um, you know, our, our newspapers have been collapsing. Community journalism, which is such a like essential cornerstone of of our country or democracy or whatever have, you know, so many of them have been going away. A lot of newspaper photographers, community newspaper photographers have lost their jobs. Um, the magazine industry is not particularly healthy. Um, you know, they didn't really navigate the transition from print to digital very well. Very few of them have, have done that. Um, National Geographic is maybe one of the few that's, um, you know, really uh, still that will that will really support long form sustained uh, photojournalism like I do. Um, it's it's tough and and to go back to what we already talked about. Um, I feel like uh, you know when I. 
when I think of myself and the path that I've walked and you know what how I imagine my own purpose and all the sacrifices that I've made um, when you know when that's rejected when my work isn't believed when we're called you know fake news um, you know it stings and uh, so yeah I don't I don't think that the the industry is great at the moment, but I think um, like it's operating on the inertia of all of these like ideals and idea, ideas about purpose and calling that we all seem to still have. Um, here's a question from Kayla Scott. What's the most eye-opening experience or person you have met that has made you feel the most fulfilled and proud of your career or work? I think I feel so lucky. I mean, all I ever wanted to do is see the world for myself with my own eyes um, and to like be in the middle of it all. And I feel so lucky for that. Um, it'd be hard to, it'd be hard to, um, to name a place or a person, uh, but I did share with you a, a picture that I took of Jane Goodall, and so I'd have to probably say, say that. And because I know not only got to photograph her and have a stiff drink with her um, and listen to her whole life story, but she told me things that, you know, that really like were an upheaval in my life. Like she said that she didn't think of herself as a scientist when she began. And even now she thinks of herself as a storyteller and that she thinks that the greatest thing that she could do or that I could do um, to get people to care about the world um, would be to tell stories. And she also said that when she was growing up, she didn't have any role models. We all have Jane. <laughs> she didn't have a Jane. And so she had to, she had to become that a person that she didn't have in her life. And um, that I think is a truly inspirational like idea, especially for, um, especially for women and young girls. I have two daughters and uh, so, I think it was Jane. Yeah, I suspect. Um, here's one. Uh, how is it different doing your, um, can you read my own? Doing your stories, particularly the geopolitical conflicts in your 40s versus your 20s? <laughs> well, you know, when I was going to Afghanistan covering war, I was in my 20s, late 20s, and the, and the Marines were, and the soldiers were 19. And then I was still going back when I was 40 and they were still 19. Um, I think that I have uh, physical limitations <laughs> that impact how I work, um, but I also have, uh, a different and deeper perspective. And I trust that instinct and I go with that versus um, what I probably did when I was younger, which was, you know, drive to the basket and dunk. Now I'm doing the fadeaway jump shot. <laughs> uh, I like that. Uh, Jorge Medina said, um, uh, what other ways have you thought of showing your work and uh, awareness and resilience message to the public. How about a Netflix special? I'm glad I'm ready to do a Netflix special. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, most of my work is, uh, you know, in the pages of National Geographic and other magazines, print and online. I use social media a lot. It really, uh, I didn't talk about it, but you mentioned it in when you introduced me. Um, social media really was a, 
a huge of a sea change in in our industry and in the way that I work as a photographer. I mean, I have but the first newspaper I worked for was 9,000 circulation and I have a, an Instagram account with over a million followers without any editor or gatekeeper or a person in the middle of that. And it's a very dynamic space where I can share whatever I want directly to people who are, uh, you know, invested in what I have to say and where I go and what I'm, what I have to talk about. So um, that's a very different, um, much more dynamic way of sharing, uh, sharing photography. It's not a like publishing at you situation. It's a conversation. Um, and I, I really love to do something like what we're doing today. I, I work with the National Geographic Live Speakers Bureau and I travel to communities and little theaters where like my favorite musicians play and I get to go up on stage and, and tell uh, stories about North Korea or stories about, um, you know, resiliency in the wild. And I love that. That's, that comes from a tradition at Nat Geo where, you know, explorers used to come back and everyone would gather around and they'd say, this is what I saw. <laughs> and uh, I think that that is a really important and impactful way. Um, and if I could do that, you know, on television and Netflix, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> um, someone else said, uh, it seems like you've lived a hundred lives. I can't believe you somehow made time for kids. How did your family cope with you being gone and in danger? It seems like there's parallels between uh, how families are worried for their loved ones working in healthcare during the pandemic. Yeah, I, you know, I shared with my wife last night I sort of gave her a, an outline of what I was gonna talk about today. And um, she, she immediately picked up on that as well. She's like, I think that that's the most, maybe the most important parallel that you can talk about with, with, this, with this particular audience. Because I know, she's like, you know that, you know that healthcare professionals are having to step out of the door and go face danger and their families are back at home you know that that's what's going on. And my family has endured that, not just my wife and my two daughters, um, who, you know, has been with me. I've been with my wife for 30 plus years from this entire story I told, she's been there. Um, and my teenage daughters, uh, they, they've really been in my corner all along. They've made it possible. They've grounded me. They, my wife has cheered me on. I'd go away. I used to go away for seven, eight months at a time. It was more like being in the military. And my family kept it, my, they, they were true believers in what I was doing. And they played a huge role in that. Um, and I couldn't be more grateful for the, for them sort of allowing me to go off and to have it all, to have a family and responsibilities and go off into the wild and do, and have this 100 lives that you, that you said that I've had. Um, and then, you know, when it comes to like my parents, my mom always said to me, <laughs> tell me when I, it's time to worry, like tell it to me straight. Otherwise I'm gonna worry about you all the time. <laughs> and I've always done that. I call her up and I say, okay, it's time to worry. <laughs> and when I'm about out, I say, okay, I'm in the clear. It's good. And that's been the way that, um, the way that I, and my, I, my biggest fear throughout my entire career was that my mother and my wife and my children's children believe in what I believed in this purpose that I've set out for myself and I always thought if something happened to me that it would pull the rug out from underneath that belief and that they would think that it was all a lie and that they wished that they had tried to stop me from doing this instead of supporting me in doing this and um because it is the absolute most incredible gift that I've had that kind of support from my 
from my family. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, and maybe we've got time for one more here. Um, based on your recent work in uh, national parks, do you think that our national parks are at greater risk now than previously, or have we realized the why and the how of preserving them? Uh, I think it's a constant battle. Um, finding the balance between uh, protecting and appreciating our public land. So we want it to be accessible for everyone, um, but then we have to face like issues around like three hour traffic jams in the natural world and um, uh, building uh, helicopter pads in the Grand Canyon and so forth versus, you know, walling it off and protecting it and only allowing a very few sort of people to get out and experience it. So it's a very, it's a really, you know, and then add to that and not to get into to politics, but add to that all of the sort of, you know, constant oscillating debates around natural resources and use of our land. So it's, uh, I think it's a constant um, reinvention every year, every four years at least uh, about what to do with our national parks. Um, but it was not a, it was not a coincidence that um, when I first picked up my camera in the United States at the age of late 40s um, that I picked the national parks as a place to begin photographing because it's something that I see as a like a crowning kind of sort of jewel of a, our country and the, like the perfect place to start my rediscovery of America. No, thank you very much. Um, well, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, we'd really like to thank uh, David Gutenfelder for his thoughts and sharing his story and his photos during the CXL Wellness Grand Rounds. Um, David, thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate it and um, we'd like you to be well. Thank you so much. The same for all of you. And thank you again for everything that you're doing. I hope that you're told that every single day. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.